Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. alaikum and welcome to Newsroom. I'm your host, Ruma Khalil. But today is the 2nd of October 2024 and these are the stories that we will be highlighting in the course of the show. We'll begin with day 361 of the uh, Gaza conflict and the Middle East starts to uh, get more and more inflamed with, uh, uh, of course, what the tit for tat is happening. We saw uh, what happened from the Israeli side and we now have seen what has happened from the Iranian side also when there was a barrage of uh, uh, you know uh, missiles that were targeted towards Israel. Uh, this said, the reactions have been very uh, quite strong from the Israeli side, from the American side as well, and from other countries as well. What is going to be uh, the future as far as these coming days is concerned uh, for this uh, conflict uh, in, I wouldn't now restrict it to Palestine, I would rather call it a Middle East conflict. Uh, will this conflict uh, get more and more, uh, you know, uh, augmented? Will it be exaggerated? Will it uh, become more violent with the days to come? Are we going to have more reactions? Because the Iranian side says that if the Israeli side reacts, the reaction from the Iranian side is going to be, again, even more severe than this time. What should we expect? or what should we not expect? This and more will be discussed in our first segment. Our second story concerns the International Day of Non-Violence that is being observed across uh, the world, including in uh, Pakistan. The purpose of observing this day, of course, is to disseminate the message of non-violence through education as well as through public awareness. It further reaffirms the desire to secure a culture of peace, tolerance, understanding and non-violence, which is the need of the day when you look at all the events that are happening across the world. This is going to be our second segment, ladies and gentlemen. Our third story concerns the first US vice presidential uh, debate that happened very recently in the US as well. Democrat Tim Walz, Republican J.D. Vance clashed at this debate, but they were much more civil than, of course, uh, uh, Donald Trump maybe was uh, in his presidential uh, debate uh, with uh, Kamala Harris, although they did, of course, uh, p m uh, p blame uh, their respective leaders, well, their opposition leaders, of course. Uh, was it a success or not? We'll try to decipher some part of it, at least, during the course of the show. And finally, we'll be, going to talking, to, we'll be talking about the web telescope that has revealed surprising details of uh, Sharon. Now, Sharon is a moon of Pluto, which uh, because of the James Webb uh, telescope has now been become more apparent. The different details have come up and also details such as uh, the presence of carbon dioxide in, in its soil. Uh, does that indicate some form of life at some uh, juncture on this moon? Well, maybe the days ahead will give us more details as far as that is concerned. Let's begin with our first segment and that concerns day 361 of uh, the Gaza conflict. Almost one year uh, is uh, going to uh, pass since this whole conflict began on the 7th of October last year. But since the 7th of October, this conflict has now escalated beyond Palestine and has entered Lebanon, has entered Syria and has entered Yemen. To discuss different aspects of the latest details res uh, regarding that and of course the involvement of Iran now that the barrage of missiles were lost, uh, launched on Israel. We've been joined by two guests. Let me introduce them to you one by one. Our first guest is Matthew Abraiza. He's a former ambassador, a White House and senior State Department official. Thank you very much, Matthew, to have joined us. And after a long hiatus, welcome back to our show. Our second guest is Vakar Rizvi. He's a senior geopolitical analyst and a dear friend. Thank you very much, Vakar, to have joined us as well. Uh, this debate is going to be a tough one. So let's begin with Matthew. Matthew, tensions have risen in Israel uh, as it vows to retaliate against Iran following its ballistic missile attack, which Iran claims was in response to the killings of Hamas, Hezbollah and IRGC leaders. The Iranian chief of staff has also threatened to hit all Israeli infrastructure if Tel Aviv retaliates. Uh, Iran's armed forces, of course, uh, he says that if the Zionist regime that has gone insane is not contained by America and Europe and intends to continue such crimes or do anything against our sovereignty or territorial integrity, uh, this operation will be repeated with much higher magnitude and we will hit all of their infrastructure. What do you foresee? Well, I think Israel is trying to figure out what to do next, and there's a debate going on. You know that uh, in recent days and weeks, uh, there was one faction, even in the Israeli military, that was uh, in favor of President Netanyahu's eagerness to go into Lebanon, and another faction that said, no, if we get bogged down again, like after you know, 2006 in a land war in Lebanon, that's exactly what Hezbollah wants, and, and it's very difficult to prevail. So. I think there's a debate going on inside Israeli establishment as to which targets to respond to uh, in Iran. 
uh, they could either, the Israelis could either go for a limited strike, similar to what Iran appears to have done now for the second time, which is focus only on, it seems, military targets in Israel, sending a message that we could do a lot more, but for now, we, we, we want to avoid an all-out war. Or I'm, I'm sure there are people like, like Minister Smotrich and Ben Gavir who are advocating something much more uh, extensive, like going after Iran's uh, nuclear uh, infrastructure. In fact, yesterday, uh, former U.S. Secretary of Defense Cohen um, actually said he – I don't know if he was recommending it, but he, sound, he said he, he, it could be that or he wouldn't be surprised if Israel went after uh, Iran's nuclear infrastructure. I, I personally think that would be a mis mistake. Uh, that would be a grave uh, escalation. Uh, it's something that could pull the U.S. into a wider war, which Biden definitely does not want just 35 days before the presidential election. And certainly Harris doesn't want that. Um, and it's, you know, uh, something I think that would not have much of an impact on Iran's nuclear capabilities because the, the, the key uh, elements thereof are, are buried inside mountains, which are even unreachable with, with bunker busting bombs. So. Uh, there will be a response by Israel. There's tough rhetoric by both Israel and the United States. Uh, and much will depend, I think, on how the debate inside the Israeli establishment plays out. Coming to you, Vakar, Pentagon says the U.S. has helped Israel shoot down the Iranian missiles. Uh, Kamala Harris pledges unwavering commitment to Israel's security. Several Republican of officials have called on the U.S. for an overwhelming and direct disproportionate response to attack Iran following this missile barrage that uh, was targeting uh, Israel. U.S. media also claim that Israel can retaliate against Iran in a few days and can target Iran's oil facilities and other strategic <coughs> sites. How do you view the U.S. perspective on this escalation and what should we expect from the U.S. side in your point of view? Uh, from the Israeli side, but of course we have the U.S. assistance, so I, I kind of uh, mix the two. Yeah, so I think that one of the things that, that we're going to see in the coming days and hours, literally, possibly, um, and Matthew is very correct about, um, you know, his his view on this, that there is a debate happening behind the scenes in Israel, right? And Netanyahu is under a lot of pressure. But we also must remember, it's very important about this context, in that Pazishkian, the new Iranian president, is, as, is under just as much pressure. Uh, we remember that Pazishkian came out very clearly and, in fact, said that they had been waiting, that he had been holding off on a quote-unquote response to the killing of Hania, specifically because he had been given promises. This is a claim that he has made by the Europeans that there would be a ceasefire of some sort in Gaza. So when we contextualize the pressure that Netanyahu may be under to respond to what's, what the Iranians did last night, Pazishkian has just as much to prove on the Iranian side, because you have to remember, Pazishkian has come in as a quote-unquote reformist, and reformists in Iran are always under a lot of pressure, especially from the conservative elements, because they always feel that they do not stand up for the country, uh, especially when it comes to such military uh, endeavors. So uh, that's very, very important to realize for both sides of the aisle. And I think that the other side also needs to realize this. So the U.S. also needs to realize that Pazishkian is under an immense amount of pressure. And so to ease this pressure, as the Iranians have said, and obviously this may be, this is very really wishful thinking, but the Iranians really want this to end now, as it is, because that's what the Iranian officials have been saying. And like I said, possibly wishful thinking because Netanyahu can't just let this go, I do not think. Um, but whatever happens next, as Matthew says, will really determine um, how this conflict then, then further develops. Because I don't actually think that the Iranians will take very kindly to any response at this specific point in time. Because, you know, I've been, I have, you know, a lot of connections within Iran and everyone has been very, very angry, really, at Pazishkian ever since he admitted that he'd been waiting out till the Europeans would respond about a ceasefire or not. Um, and so that kind of pressure, even if you hit a desert at this point in time, the Iranians will view that very negatively. And I believe that that would also then create, uh, you know, some sort of a, a response from the Iranian side. All right. Now, Matthew, the U.S. describes Iran's attack as a failure and ineffective. Israel says that there were no casualties in the attack as Iran's revolutionary guards claim that 90 percent of its missiles have been able to reach their targets. This is, the, of course, we all know second time this year that Iran has targeted uh, uh, Israel with uh, missiles. Uh, at the same time, we know that Ira Israel's backbone's defense system is its iron dome, which is capable of preventing any type of mi missile or drone system from entering its uh, territory. Uh, also, in all of this context, do you feel that uh, damage was caused 
by this barrage of missiles because the US says no, Israel says no. Uh, other analysts do uh, counter it others why there's lots of videos on social media that also uh, you know show some kind of uh, uh, you know um, destruction, uh, minor destruction if I might say. Do you feel this had had any kind of impact as far as infrastructure uh, is concerned because I know there are no casualties. Yeah, I don't think so. Were those one casualty? One unfortunate Palestinian man in Jericho uh, was killed, maybe by falling debris from one of the intercepted missiles. But no, it doesn't seem like there was much physical impact. I mean, uh, what do we have to go on? Media reports, right? I mean, poor Al Jazeera cannot report from inside Israel. The government doesn't allow it. But I watch. I've been watching TRT World all day, <clears throat> CNN which has significant assets on the ground. And what, what CNN has reported is what you were saying, essentially, that there was some damage. There was apparently damage to an Air Force base, an Israeli Air Force base. Uh, CNN had showed uh, damage of a next to a school, a crater that was hit uh, mercifully at night when there were no students there. So no, I, I don't think there was much of an impact at all uh, in terms of degrading Israel's infrastructure physically. Uh, but it did scare it did scare Israelis, the attack. And I, I, I've spoken to several uh, Israeli colleagues or friends uh, who said it, it was terrible being in their, you know, their safe rooms or bunkers for 30 minutes yesterday. And some of them could could hear and feel the explosions. So there's a psychological impact how that plays out i don't know i, I think if, if i may expand just for a moment i, I think that pr prime minister netanyahu has decided to to roll the proverbial dice right he has decided to go for a maximal solution to all of israel's problems i mean first it started getting getting nudged by by ben gavir and by smotrich uh to to i think push the palestinians out of the palestinian territories uh that has turned into a disaster with all the human suffering in gaza uh we now have the missile strikes by by iran i think that he's he's he uh, netanyahu wants to try as he said to, to destroy hamas but also he's trying to cripple hezbollah and he's gotten gotten himself into something that is much bigger, I think, than most Israelis bargained for. Yes, they were horrified what would, by what happened on October 7th, and maybe were willing to to give him some some extra rope to really retaliate. Uh, but now, when we get to this point, when you're when you're hunkered down in your bunkers with your family for 30 minutes, I think that's got to have a psychological impact on the body politic. But again, it goes back to that but debate Matthew, inside Matthew, Israel. Very society. frank, Matthew. Matthew, to be very frank, this is the fear factor that Israel has been using on Palestinians since uh, October last year as well. This fear factor has also uh, been so much ordained within the Palestinian people that the slightest sound and they, you know, also cuddle up uh, in whatever uh, shorts or small places they can. Do. So this is the same fear factor has now affected the Israelis and maybe they have an idea or an inkling of what Palestine is going through since October, uh, you know, last year as well. So uh, fear factor, although it might not be as, you know, uh, effective is nevertheless a small factor uh, in this in the direction of, uh, you know, uh, the people uh, getting an idea of what war means. What's your take on that as well? To me, yeah. Uh, I, I hope so. I hope so. You know, the, the media coverage in Israel has been very uh, filtered uh, without showing the consequences of the war. So you make a great point. I mean, maybe just hearing and feeling these explosions will have an impact. But but I worry that or, or I, I worry that, as I said, Netanyahu has decide really to to go for the maximalist option and try to maybe resolve all of Israel's manifold security problems in one fell swoop with multiple operations. And I think he, he may feel empowered to do that because of the shock of October 7th. Right. For I mean, for Israelis, that was the largest loss of Jewish life since the Holocaust. And so they much like we Americans reacted to September 11th, uh, they, they are lashing out emotionally uh, and, and, and countenancing uh, actions that if they they know it's what their government is doing. They may not oppose them because of the because of their own fear factor that goes back to October 7th. Fortunately, uh, Israelis now since then have not been suffering the horrendous uh, human uh, pain and, and horrible suffering that the Palestinians in Gaza have been enduring. All right. Uh, you know, coming to you, Vakar, I have many things to ask you, so I'll jumble them up uh, together. There are several developments that have happened. The Office of Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney says she's going to host a group of seven leaders today to discuss the escalating crisis. She, uh, she says there's deep concern about these uh, developments. Jordanian government says it will not allow the country to become a battleground. They say protecting Jordan and Jordanians is our first responsibility. The Lebanese army says Israeli forces briefly crossed into its territory that they call the blue line before withdrawing. Israeli foreign minister says he is barring United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres 
from entering the country for his failure to unequivocally condemn Iran's huge missile attack on Israel. The head of Hezbollah's media office, Mohammed Afif, also says the group has enough fighters, weapons and ammunition to push back Israel. The Kremlin, Russia, says the situation in the Middle East is developing in an alarming direction and has called on all sides to exercise restraint. So has China. How do you view all these developments? There are a lot of developments, but I'd like your point of view. You know, I think that the world always comes up with these statements. We always have these emergency meetings when these sorts of events happen. Um, but I think that the sort of realities of the region and on the ground have changed. Um, the fact is that, as Matthew there said, um, the entire mission here has been to defeat Hamas and to essentially bring it down to its knees. That has not actually occurred. Um, and Hamas is the weakest out of all of the other groups that we can discuss, right? So if we if we claim to be discussing all Iran-aligned groups, whatever that may mean, uh, we, we, can, we will be comparing the likes of the Houthis, um, the Hashem Sha'adi in Iraq, um, of course, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and of course, the Iranians themselves, certainly. So um, Hamas is certainly the weakest out of all of the above, simply for the fact that it is it has been surviving under a blockade. And so getting weapons or, or other such things into the, the blockaded territory was extremely difficult. Military know-how, of course, they were getting from the Iranians or others within this group. So the fact that that very group has not been defeated yet, um, I think that that just goes to show that the reality on the ground is very different from what it may have been in the past. And that realization, I don't think, has really hit the rest of the world um, in it with as much fervor and with as much significance as it should have by now. Uh, because but if it due had, respect, Bakar, let, 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 let me interrupt you here. With due respect, Bakar, Bakar, let me interrupt you here. With due respect, a year has gone by. We are seeing the thousands and tens of thousands of people who have been yeah. butchered by Israel and almost 100,000 who have been injured. And we don't even know the exact amount because this is just uh, the uh, uh, the official amount. There are so many tens of thousands who are buried in the rubble, but because the Lancet yeah. says that there are more than 180,000 who have been killed as, as far as this conflict is concerned. Does the world need uh, more time to wake up? <laughs> um, I just I just think the world is trying to wash its hands of the entire situation. No one has the political courage to take that first step. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm pointing to literally the entire world, right? I think that even um, the Iranians, of course, their strategic patience, um, whatever they may term it, um, you know, it has resulted in what's now happened last night. Um, but I think that even that came only because the Iranian interests themselves were affected, right? Uh, so we had the IRGC uh, commanders who were also killed along with Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah. Uh, and we've had, you know, we of course had when Soleimani was killed as well in Iraq, the Iranians you know, responded very strategically and very directly on an American base. So I think that um, at this point in time, no one's willing to take that political courage vis-a-vis -vis Gaza specifically. Uh, sure, there is a lot of rhetoric. Um, yes, of course, there is certainly military know-how um, being exchanged between the Iranians and Hamas. But that in and of itself, as you pointed out correctly, Omar, is not going to solve the situation in Gaza, considering we're back here virtually a year later. All right, Matthew, let's talk about also the attack that happened within uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, the number of dead has uh, risen to seven after one of the victims uh, succumbed to his wounds overnight. Two assailants in their 20s who were residents of the occupied West Bank were uh, uh, behind it all. Uh, one of the attackers was shot dead, the other was seriously wounded. Uh, do you feel such incidents are going to happen more often looking at the way this whole conflict is escalating? I, yes, I do, Omar. I mean, if you look at the way the settlers and the Israeli authorities have been treating the Palestinians in the West Bank, I can't imagine the Palestinians are ever just going to say, oh, OK, you persuaded us. You're so strong. <laughs> we give in. Keep, keep, you know, keep attacking us. Now, I think that violence begets violence in this situation. Uh, and it's more than violence. It's it's. Uh, emotions out of control. And I think, as I was saying before, there's a quest on the part of, of Netanyahu and his uh, the extremists in his government mm. to push the Palestinians out. Where to? Who knows? Uh, but he, they, they are trying to regain all of the West Bank for, for Israel. And, and, and as Vakar was saying, there's just a lack of political uh, confidence and, and courage, especially in Washington, where they, they know what's going on. Uh, but because it's an election year and or because of President Biden's longstanding affinity for Israel, uh, they're not willing really to call it like what it is and are instead saying, well, everyone should talk to each other and there should be a ceasefire. But, you know, sometimes uh, 
calling for a ceasefire and more dialogue is, is not the solution. Sometimes there has to be much forceful action taken or things are just going to get worse. All right. And now, Vakar, you know, let's talk about Joe Biden and his uh, famous ceasefire uh, agreement that he had been pushing forward since weeks and weeks. We heard it's going to happen and it's not going to happen. Then Hamas said that it was all f in favor of it, said that more than once, never happened. Israelis had always took out something uh, to uh, not go forward with it. And now we see the escalation in the violence. Is there any future for the ceasefire agreement or should we just put it aside now? Until and unless the, the rest of the world acts in a forceful fashion, as Matthew there mentioned, uh, I like that wording, uh, it has to be forceful. Uh, because if it's not going to be, then I do not see uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu wanting to really enter into a ceasefire because that would just make him look weak, um, especially considering he is in a coalition government with, with a very extreme right wing ministers. So uh, they're probably speaking to his ear and saying, uh, you dare do this, essentially, for, if I'm paraphrasing. Uh, so I, I do not think that, um, you know, they would look kindly upon any ceasefire agreement at this point in time, unless uh, the rest of the world, Washington, uh, London, or the rest of these these very important allies of Israel really speak up in, in what Matthew called a forceful fashion. All right. Thank you very much to both of my guests, Vakar Azvi, Senior Geopolitical Analyst, and Matthew Braiser, former Ambassador, White House, and Senior State Department official, to have joined us and to have discussed with us these latest developments that are emanating in the Middle East. Uh, and it looks as if this is going to be uh, get worse from now on. But I hope that better sense prevails and that diplomacy uh, takes effect. We'll be back after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching the newsroom. And of course, our second segment is also as important as the first. And that concerns the International Day of Nonviolence. Nonviolence is extremely important when you look what is happening in Palestine, when you look what is happening in the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. And now that we see different parts of the world burning, the need for nonviolence becomes even more important, pertinent, critical. Today is that very uh, important day as enshrined by the United Nations. The purpose of this day is to disseminate the message of nonviolence through education and through public awareness. We've been joined by Saleha Zakir Shah. She's the Director of General Communications and Outreach at NACTA to discuss exactly that from a Pakistani perspective. Thank you very much, Ma'am Saleha, to have joined us. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Ma'am Saleha, today is the International Day of Nonviolence. According to the General Assembly Resolution, ARES 61-271, dated 20, uh, 15th of June 2007, which established the commemoration, the International Day is an occasion to disseminate the message of non-violence, including through education and public awareness. I've said it twice before, but I wanted to highlight this again. The resolution reaffirms the universal relevance of the principle of non-violence and the desire to secure a culture of peace, of tolerance, of understanding, and of non-violence. The premise looks very promising when you look at, at the resolution on paper, but the reality is totally very, very different from that. Uh, what needs to be done to kind of align such documentations with reality? Well, that's quite a difficult question and a rather lengthy one. Um, however, I'd like to start by saying that resolutions um, are always far from reality. They are a dream. They are a promised dream, a shared vision of humankind to achieve something that they do not have. The very fact that a resolution exists is because we do need nonviolence and we need tolerance and we need peace in the world. Uh, how can it be done? Well, all members need to get together for that. That's why there is a UN resolution. And they need to be committed to peace and nonviolence. They need to look at this as a future for our children, the entire globe, not just one country or one people. Um, the kinetic measures, as much as uh, some would resort to them, uh, are non-permanent. The only thing, the only permanent resolution is a resolution of non-violence, where mm. people tolerate each mm. other. Mm. Um, Nectar does kind of try to play its role. Uh, we uh, hold a lot of awareness events and we try to remind people that non-violence is the only way ahead. Mm. And once we are all committed towards it, I see no reason why the shared dream cannot be realized. But you know, Ma'am Saleh, when you look at the world today, at societies today, the violence has kind of 
become part and parcel of our social values somehow it has integrated so much into our youth into our into the people not just here but everywhere where we see a violent attitude in people's uh, uh, you know uh, uh, comments we see that in the way they address their elders we see that in the way they address others there is less and less of uh, uh, the trust there is less and less of understanding and there is more and more of violence now I'd like to I mean, this was just a premise that I wanted to put in forward but our United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres on the occasion had a very important uh, you know statement that he made he, he talked about our world today bristling with violence and I, I think you couldn't agree more with that across the globe conflicts are raging we've seen the conflicts Sudan Middle East uh, Ukraine uh, and we are seeing how the Middle East is also now slowly and steadily escalating inequality and climate chaos is also something that he pointed out that are undermining the foundations of peace uh, uh, he also referred to the uh, to last month's summit of the future where of course there was a uh, very important Pakistani attendance as well as well as a Pakistan perspective that was laid down uh, he talks about a renewed focus on the underlying causes of conflict from inequality to poverty to division he says we need now countries to transform these commitments into reality how ready are we in Pakistan to transform these commitments into reality well as a part of uh, part of this organization that is uh, entrusted with the job of uh, non kinetic measures for mm. peace I kind of find myself fortunate being in Pakistan because our people inherently are tolerant, are non-violent. Mm. Uh, we are uh, the proud uh, owners of a civilization uh, that uh, has had no weapons in, in, in its uh, archaeological sites. Uh, so Pakistan and the people of Pakistan are uh, probably the best example of what could be uh, uh, non-violent uh, non and a tolerant uh, society. Uh, the only thing that we need to do is to remind people of that. And that's something that we need to do all the time. This is something, uh, times are difficult, times are very turbulent and nobody can dispute that. Mm. But in such times, uh, somebody who's already uh, poised for peace and has always lived in peace, it's easier to remind them of the message than Agreed. of the people who have never uh, experienced that, mm. that beautiful and golden time. So it's just something that our ancestors have been doing. Uh, I understand that times are turbulent. I mm. understand our youth has far more challenges than they were before. Mm. It's just important that we keep on reminding ourselves that violence is not a solution to any kind of conflict ever. Mm. And it is not a resolution to any problem. It has never been, it never will be. Mm. Uh, that's just something that we have to keep on telling each other you know and have believe in it. You know, even our societal values, our traditions, our culture uh, is non-violent in nature and that is when we see our parents, how we, they have treated us, when we see our, uh, uh, the whole uh, you know, family structure does not promote violence in any form or nature and that is why it becomes even more pertinent for countries like Pakistan to become that example for other nations Absolutely. to follow. Now this principle of non-violence, Ma'am Saleh, which is also known as non-violence resistance, rejects the use of physical violence in order to achieve social or political change. These alternate narratives related measures have the potential to diffuse the conditions which of course currently at least in the last few years have been threatening peace and stability across the world. How is NACTA using this approach to address the issue of violence? Well, policy makers all around the world are now realizing that it is the power of storytelling that's selling pretty much at the moment and unfortunately uh, people who are kind and trusting in their heart by stories and conspiracies. It is important for governments all across the globe to tell the people truth, the bare truth. And uh, as much as it is uh, possibly called alternate narrative, or um, it's, it's just setting the record straight, which we need to do with our people. Mm. Tell them how things really are and what uh, interest groups might uh, work mm. uh, promoting uh, violence and non-tolerance. Um, NECTA, of course, uh, as, as I represented, uh, is taking uh, very effective measures in doing that in, in counter-narrative. Um, we do a lot of things from awareness sessions in universities to a lot of sport activities. Uh, the, uh, the idea is very simple. Uh, the idea is truth and the fact that truth always wins no mm. matter how hard and long the road is. It's just important that we don't buy lies as easy as we, uh, mm. some people do. Uh, uh, lies sell more easily. Mm. They have a better rate of spreading. 
However, they do really damage our society. Exactly. As if that's the only thing that we need to educate our people in mm. truth. I mean, that is, you know, uh, a very, uh, at this moment, looking at the situation, it doesn't look like a very easy task. No, it And doesn't. so the responsibility or the onus of responsibility on actor becomes even Absolutely. much more uh, in under these current circumstances. Now, while non-violence, Ma'am Salia, is frequently used as a synonym for pacifism, since the mid-20th century, the term non-violence has been adopted by many movements for social change, which do not focus on opposition to war. Now, one key doctrine of this theory of non-violence is that the power of rulers depends on the consent of the population and non-violence, therefore, seeks to undermine such power through withdrawal of the consent and cooperation of the populace. How has this adoption for social change worked in favor of movements in the 20th and the 21st century? How, what has NACTA's role been in this context as far as, you know, uh, be, becoming very clear or, uh, you know, uh, clearly underlying the terms and situations as far as non-violence and violence is concerned? Well, I have a firm belief and I do hope you would agree that uh, violence uh, just doesn't work. And all major movements, uh, political or religious, all over the world, all over history, have always succeeded on the basis of tolerance and non-violence. Violence has a very short-term life and it dies its own death because it breeds, breeds on fear and there is a, there's just a lifespan of fear. It just doesn't last. Uh, and has this been uh, successful? Well, in very recent past, uh, Pakistan itself. We've taken our freedom out of a non-violent movement and we're very proud of the fact. Um, we've, we've, uh, and so has been, I think, the American civil rights movement. Mm. Uh, South Africa is a case in point in recent history. Uh, well, NICTA only comes on screen in 2013. That's where, when we were mandated with the task. Uh, but that said, uh, we have a long history to prove that non-violence is the only thing that works in the end. Mm. And that makes our task a little more easy. Um, it's very easy to tell the truth. It's very easy to tell what is right. Uh, it's a little difficult to adopt it. Mm. Uh, it's, it's a little difficult path yeah. and we all know that. And it has always been that way. But that's, that's really the but way it's going to Salia, be. You know, uh, deviating a little bit, you know, the concepts of reality, truth, and uh, falsehood have become so blurred. The lines have become so thin between them, especially uh, in these last few years, whether it be our region or the world or uh, in the world, that uh, sometimes it becomes a question mark for all those people who are reading through whatever comes on social media or on media for that matter, as to what to accept as truth and what not. How can we clearly predefine lines between what is right, what is wrong, what is truth and what is false? Well, we have to develop a little bit of critical thinking. And we do have to remind ourselves of common manners and ethics, really. What I say, is it really beneficial? Does it really help someone? Or is it just hurtful and negative? Mm. If there's something that I'm doing that's constructive at, at any point in time, even if it's a little act of kindness, well, then I really should out, out to go and do it. Mm. But if it's just plain hurtful, why say things that are hurtful? Why mm. hear things that are not constructive? We just have to deviate our time from things that are negative, non-constructive and think more about things that are uh, constructive, that don't hurt people, uh, bringing a little bit of smile to everyone. True. It, does, it costs nothing really. Mm. Small acts of kindness. 14 muscles cost. for to smile, 72 muscles to frown. So, you know, I always used to learn <laughs> that as a kid and I used to tell that everybody, you know, better smile than frown because uh, uh, smile brings kindness yes. uh, to the environment and it's very important and pertinent to make other people feel happy about themselves and you know, because there's a lot of stress in this environment, yes. especially in the 21st century yes. and we need to, uh, you know, uh, take out measures or be kind ourselves so as to make the environment environment a better place to live in. Now, speaking of kindness, Kindness Matters is one of the campaigns that UNICEF has taken out as well. Do you feel such campaigns matter in the long run when it comes to maybe disseminating uh, a positive attitude within the community and also lessening the impact of falsehoods that prevail within it? I, I, I most wholeheartedly do. I think every act of kindness, no matter how small it is, has a great potential. Isn't that what a matchstick tells us? 
Mm. But what potential it has, it's mm. just a small thing. Uh, can these campaigns bring change? Yes, they can, because what they advocate is synergy. Mm. Uh, small acts of kindness that everybody does, and we join hands in doing them, do make, make a change. When we do one person doing an act of kindness, it kind of induces us to do another, while there's so much negative uh, stuff, mm. so, so to say, on social media, that all those sweet, kind things with a cat, roaming around in a forest, for example, mm. flowers, children smiling. There's so many nice things to look at. And then there's so much constructive things to do as well, I mm. dare say. So why, my, might as well do that. You know, there are so many constructive things, but you know, in this day and age, we need a, a culture and environment of peace and non-violence where we can strive for peace, we can, where we can strive for sustainable development. We can also follow the United Nations SDGs as well. And, uh, you know, uh, when we look at decisions, there are so many things that come to mind when it comes to how to develop peace, how to, you know, move in an environment or be part of an environment that can only uh, strive for positivity, positive development, whether it be human rights education, whether it be skills for peaceful relations, whether it be good governance, prevention of uh, you know, uh, peace building uh, and uh, conflict, the right of quality education, advancement of science and its application to develop knowledge and capacity for economic and social progress, peace and sustainable development. There are so many things that come into mind. Uh, can we gather all of them? Can NACTA, you know, uh, gather all of these elements and much more, make a huge jumble of it and just, you know, disseminate this to the uh, society within I Pakistan. I wish, <laughs> I wish we could, we could do these things with, uh, with, with a magic wand, but, but they don't happen like this. Hmm. Uh, Nonviolence, tolerance, peace hmm. is a behavior, it's a culture. And one needs to mm. cultivate that, these things with a lot of care and effort. Mm. Mm. We need to develop in each of us critical thinking. We need to educate ourselves. We need to uh, have a respect for diversity. Mm. Mm. We need to see the beauty in diversity and mm. inclusiveness. And that's not something that, that can come from outside and maybe, you know, make a change in a moment. It's something that each one of us uh, has to do and can do. Mm. I do... Uh, agree to the fact, of course, nobody can deny that economic development and other things uh, play a huge part. Uh, there's no denying that. But then there is violence and non-tolerance in societies which are so-called economically development. Mm. So there's a little more to it than that. Mm. Um, it is the people. The change that people want, the people have to be that change. It's not going to come from outside. Mm. It is us, me, you, all of us here and our viewers and everybody else around the globe. Mm. We all it's add a collective in a little, responsibility, basically. Absolutely. We mm. all add in, and uh, media plays a major role. I of need course. not we, remind we are, you that. That is why you are here on our channel. <laughs> yeah, That's absolutely. why you are promoting uh, non-violence, because this is, I think, the need of the hour when we look at the world and whatever the world is offering right now. It's not a positivity if I see. And that is where the role of your organization becomes even more paramount, you know, to be that uh, torch bearer. We try our best. The number of awareness campaigns that we do, if you do have a few minutes, I'd probably like to go through all of them, but mm. we do have essay writing competitions, mm. posters, uh, reels, short films. Uh, we do seminars in universities. We gather all kinds of uh, people in every social strata. Mm. Um, sports, cycling, walk, things like this, just to remind people that uh, truth and patience, tolerance, non-violence, they go a long way. And together we can make that change. It's together we can make that change. I think that is what I will take from our conversation. It is a collective effort under the ambit of organizations such as yours that we can make a real change in the society and be an example for other societies to follow. Thank you very much, Ma'am Saleha, Zakir Shah, DG Communications and Outreach NACTA to have joined us kindly. Stay with us for a few more moments while I uh, uh, you know, complete the show. We have just two small stories to share with our public. Let's. Uh, come to our last two stories. The first concerns the first U.S. vice presidential debate. We'd had the two vice presidential nominees from both the Democrats and the Republicans. We had Tim Waltz and Republican J.D. Vanser who clashed on Tuesday in this vice presidential debate. And as you very well know in this debate, uh, although it was much more civilized than uh, the presidential debate, but uh, of course uh, there was a lot of uh, pointing of fingers when it comes to uh, both uh, the uh, vice presidential nominees and each one of us of course uh, pointing the finger towards uh, 
the presidential candidate of the other party. But that is normal under the uh, under the current circumstances. But of course, there's also Donald Trump who was watching and who was also tweeting regularly uh, that even the ch channel moderators were not uh, uh, doing the needful. I would not uh, add to the statements that he said, but of course, this is the basic uh, crux of what he was saying. Finally, the Webb telescope has revealed uh, surprising details as far as Pluto's moon Sharon is concerned. Now, observations by the James Webb Space Telescope are giving scientists a fuller image of uh, what this moon is all about. It has uh, detected for the first time carbon dioxide and hydrogen peroxide as well. But hydrogen peroxide was already detected uh, before, but uh, carbon dioxide has now been detected for the very first time. And this is extremely interesting in the wake of all uh, you know the uh, latest uh, developments that are coming. Was there life at some part at on Pluto or on this moon? Maybe time will tell us in the days and years to come. With that, we come to an end of today's newsroom. Ladies and gentlemen, we will see you in Charlotte tomorrow with new stories and segments that pertain to us, you and Parkinson. Stay safe. Allah Hafiz.